Well, hello, I'm Janet Morena, Executive Director of Priest for Life. Welcome to Just Ask Janet. And I'm so excited today because a dear friend of mine and Father Pavones is joining me today. Of course, you might have heard him a lot on EWTN Radio. And he is just in love with the Lord and also out there helping us all get our spiritual act together. So welcome to the program, Deacon Harold Burke. Sivers, Deacon, welcome to the program. Thank you, Janet. It's great to be with you. I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled to have you. And listen, I'm going to ask you first a little vocational question, all right? I know you were in law enforcement, and tell us uh, briefly about that, but then how did you make the leap into the diaconate, okay? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, we're immigrants to the United States, uh, you know, born in Barbados, and we're first generation to come to the United States. And so my mom was the first Catholic. She was a convert uh, from Methodism. And I am the first baptized Catholic in my family. So um, my mom worked really hard to make sure we had uh, great educational opportunities. And I became the first person in my family to go to college. And uh, during college, I had an academic scholarship. But back then uh, at Notre Dame, the uh, only ones, uh, students that got full rides uh, were athletes and PhD students. So I had to uh, take a job on campus, which was working interning at the campus police department. And so I was also discerning monastic life at the time. So after I graduated, I continued to work for the police department full time for another year and then joined the monastery. Uh, when I discerned out of monastic life, I uh, met my wife or the woman who ended up being my wife. We moved to the West Coast and I still felt and I got back into law enforcement and I still felt that pull, that tug, that attraction. And so when we got to Oregon, where my wife is from, uh, I discovered the diaconate. And so I uh, went through the process, was ordained uh, 19 years ago and I was working in law enforcement. I was now the chief at the University of Portland. So I was uh, became chief in 2001, was ordained in 2002. And then um, as as time went on, I felt that God was calling me for more. And so that's in 2012, I made the decision to leave my career and to speak and to write full time. Wow. Now, you know, uh, Deacon Harold, some people don't realize for a, a married man to pursue the diaconate, <clears throat> his wife is a very integral part of that process, that discernment. And then during the course of the forma formation, the wives get very involved. Can you tell us a little bit? Because, you know, maybe people are watching right now and some men are saying, hmm, maybe God's calling me to this. Or maybe there's a wife watching saying, hmm, my husband might make a good deacon. Can you tell us, like, how does that husband-wife thing journey work towards the ordination to diaconate? That is a great question, Janet. And, and you're right. The wives do have an integral part and, and in a very important say in all this as, as well. In many dioceses, um, there's, there's a process. So there's something called the propodeutic year, which is a discernment year. Um, then after that year, that's when the actual formation starts. And, um, and then there's the uh, minor orders, right? So there's lector, acolyte, and then call to candidacy, and then ordination. Every step along the way, the wife has to give her yes. And in our diocese, and I know in some others as well, it's a formal process. So before the man goes to the next step, the bishop actually wants to hear from the wife, yes, my husband can continue. If she doesn't give that yes, then boom, you're done. No questions asked, just like that. <laughs> so the wife is integral because the church wants to ensure that uh, the husband who is serving, that's what the word deacon means, diakonia in Greek means to serve, that he's serving well in his family with his wife and his children. And God is, uh, the church is discerning whether God is calling this man to use those servant gifts to now expand that to serve the entire church. And so a wife, because that sacrament, the two become one, right? In Genesis chapter two, that's why it's integral and extremely important that they are one in this decision to move forward in the diaconate. Wow. And I'm sure your wife must, you know, in the course of serving in the parish you serve in, I mean, she probably gets involved to a certain degree, doesn't she? Well, th that's th there's a spectrum to that as well. There's one end where the wife gives her support 100%. 
you know, I'm behind you, I support you, but I'm not really interested in serving with you, right? That, that kind of a thing, because she's doing her own thing. And that's my case. My wife is a, a clinical therapist, has a full-time practice, um, and you know, she, she's doing her own thing, but she's fully, completely supportive of the diaconal ministry that I, that I exercise, both in and outside of the parish. And then you have the other end of the spectrum where you know uh, uh, wives are doing, for example, marriage preparation with their husbands, or they're they're doing uh, more ministerial uh, type of assisting uh, with their husbands. And then there's a whole bunch in between. So uh, there is a wide spectrum of how wives participate. Although in, in that propedeutic year, that discernment year, the wives are intimately involved because they're discerning together. You know, um, and uh, the move forward uh, to diaconal ministry. Yeah. Well, for any men or wives out there think your husbands are called, this is an opportunity. Talk. Start with your parish priest. Talk to him first, and then who knows? God might be calling you. Okay. So now, Deacon Harold, you said you were in law enforcement, and as we know, last year, boy, oh boy, do the boys in blue nationwide take a beating with the, you know. <clears throat> the Black Lives Matter and defund the police mantra we were hearing. And, you know, how did you feel about that being you were a good cop and you know so many good cops? How can you respond to that? Well, not only that, Janet, um, people don't realize that I was also uh, president of the Western Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators. I've had training at FLETC, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia and also at Quantico at the FBI Academy. And uh, I also was selected by two successive governors to be on the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training for the state of Oregon, which trains police officers. So I am intimately involved in the training of police. Um, and so when I saw the video of George Floyd, it made me sick. And I guarantee you, there is no police technique that is taught anywhere where you kneel on someone's neck for nine minutes. That's ridiculous. I kept saying to myself, get off of him, get off of him. I, get I was kind of yelling at the TV because it was horrific. Um, now, have I had to put people to the ground? Yes. Have I had to kneel on people? Yes. But you take those, you take those uh, uh, actions to protect them and to protect yourself, to keep yourself, others safe. And once they are under control, then everything stops. It's that simple, but that's not what happened there. Here's what I think the problem is. In the police academy, what what we what they don't do, and and when it's about not defund the police, that's ridiculous. Police reform, yes, I'll be the first one to say yes to that. Why? Because the the police academy does not do quite a good job of screening bias out of police officers. Yes, there's psychological tests and oral interviews and things like that, but but those don't capture fully someone's bias, particularly toward or prejudice towards someone of another race. And so what we're doing is we're teaching these officers techniques and they're combining these techniques with their bias. And that's what's causing the problem. So I think we need to take a step back and look at how we can better screen for biases and prejudice and in some cases racism uh, and, and do a better job of not only screening those guys out, but identifying it and maybe uh, through some training and development to help um, the, see the humanity in the person standing in front of you. That's right. I mean, if anything, Deacon Harold, wouldn't you say it's more like don't defund the police. We need more funding of the police so that there is more training post academy down the road, continuing, you know, I was a teacher for like 12 years, New York city board of ed. We always had staff development, teacher training ongoing, and so it seems to me no brainer, the police should be budgeted more training. Wouldn't you say that's the solution, more training? Yes, I, I would say that. And the, the thing is this, when you're dealing with people, uh, for, at least for me, the and, and talking with a, a number of uh, law enforcement officers, it's difficult to deal with, particularly people with mental health issues or drug issues. Because I remember once myself, I was we were talking with a guy who was who was really high and I was using verbal de-escalation techniques. And my officers were there and, and I showed up at the scene because you know I was training the officers on using verbal techniques and not so much using uh, the other, um, uh, the other uh, uh, 
tools that we use in the force continuum, like um, pepper spray and, and the aspatom and all that stuff. So I was there verbally de-escalation. It was going great. I'm thought, yes, we have this guy under control. Everything's great. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he lunges at me. I'm like, oh, no. And then, bam, we had to take him to the ground and, and, and cuff him. Uh, but, you know, so, so some of these things are very volatile. And I don't think people realize that or understand that. Most cops out there get it. And they're trying to be uh, good humanitarians when they're dealing with this. But you're right. We, you know, we need to be trained on uh, when we have someone with a mental health issue, how do we approach that? Some that's maybe schizophrenic, you know, realizing that some of these people may have served our country as veterans. Some of them may have just hit on bad times. You know, they lost a job and then one thing led to another. Now they're on the street. So we have to see that humanity in the person and realize that we're responding to a situation that this person is causing, but this is a human being made in the image and likeness of God. And so we have to think that way. And what we're trying to do is help the person. We're not trying to hurt them. We're not trying to harm them. Right. Um, and and uh, so I think, I think you're right. I think training needs to be given to officers. We can better be trained to deal with those difficult situations. Well, and that's kind of like what Mother Teresa said, that the the people she would minister to would learn about Jesus by encountering her. And so I think that's what you're saying. It's our way of reaching out to these people. They see that calm officer, that well-trained officer that is not being confrontational initially, but trying to diffuse the situation. So now I'd like to switch gears just a little bit and say, okay, we know all actually we heard about Black Lives Matter. And of course, here at Priest for Life, we want to say all lives do matter. All, you know, races from the womb to the tomb matters. And what can you say about the whole life issue in regard to that about, you know, you know, the, we're one human race, one human blood. And, you know, what's your feeling on all that? Yeah. So what we have to do is we have to separate Black Lives Matter, the words from the movement. OK, because they become conflated. There is nothing wrong with the actual term Black Lives Matter. And of course, as you correctly said, Janet, all lives matter, of course. But we have to be careful here because when we when, when we say the term as a social construct, Black Lives Matter, what we're saying is, there's a group of people who recognize that they've been disenfranchised because of slavery and Jim Crow laws and these kinds of things. And um, they're just bringing attention to the fact that, hey, we're here. We want to hear our voices heard. You know, we have issues that we're dealing with in the culture that we want attention brought to those things so that we can bring healing and reconciliation, you know, so that we can create better opportunities for our families. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. So when people say, well, that doesn't matter, all lives matter, just out of hand, in a sense, you're dismissing the legitimate needs and concerns of a particular group of people. Now, right. you, but, but, but when you say Black Lives Matter, the organization, that clearly no Catholic can support that. Um, I'm writing about this right now. I'm writing a book uh, called A Civilization of Love, uh, A Catholic Response to Racism. And I'm pointing out in that book that the organization itself the, it, it really doesn't care about Black Lives Mattering. What it is, is trying to uh, deconstruct the nuclear family. Is that That's its goal. And it's using Black Lives Matter as a veneer. And the problem is, Janet, is that the Black Lives Matter, the words, social construct, has become conflated and confused with the Black Lives Matter movement. And so now they're all together and people can't separate them out. Um, and so, for, for example, I was doing... Uh, I was going to do a radio show for uh, a, a podcast in Australia, in Sydney, Australia. And the guy put out an advertisement on Instagram. Deacon Harold is going to talk about Black Lives Matter, which I was going to explain what I just did now. We, we the, the, the words versus the movement. And people automatically thought just by looking at the advertisement, I was supporting Black Lives Matter movement. And that, so people started uh, defriending me. They started sending me nasty uh, notes and emails. I'm like, what are you guys doing? And so the, the guy hosting the show says, should I take it down? I'm like, nope. We go, because now you have to actually listen to what I have to say about this. You know, so it's become very confused. And so that's what I'm going to attempt to do, Janet, to separate the words from the movement. Great. And of course, you know, I know um, President Trump started working on this. Um, 
uh, the last year of his presidency, making uh, Juneteenth uh, a federal holiday, which finally came into fruition this year. Uh, and I have to say, like, I knew about Juneteenth for over a decade or more, uh, very familiar with Juneteenth. But I think finally, finally now nationwide, people are going to learn about Juneteenth. What can you say about that? Yeah. So for those who don't know what that is, um, when Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, um, you know, it, all of a sudden everybody just wasn't freed like that. So what Juneteenth is, it's celebrating the day when the, the Emancipation Proclamation finally filtered its way down to the to the last plantation and, and, the, and the last slaves were finally freed. Um, and so that that was a that was a process. It took a while. And so we say Juneteenth, that was the, the day, I think Texas was the state where the right. last slaves were, were freed. And, uh, and so now the, 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 we have always celebrated that in the uh, black community, but now, as you mentioned, uh, through the efforts of, of former President uh, Trump, uh, it's now a national uh, holiday. So that, you know, and it's, and it's important to remember things like this, just like it's important to remember the Holocaust. We, we, we don't want to, uh, create the mistakes of the past. And so by remembering them and honoring the people who suffered through them, we try to create, uh, again, civilization of love in a society where we um, are making sure we see the dignity of the human person. That's why the work for Priest for Life is so incredibly important, that we see the dignity of every single human being and not repeat the mistakes of the past. And that's why that day is important. Right. And of course, you know, we like to say, uh, Deacon Harold, that um, abortion and, and the fight for the unborn is the civil rights movement of today, uh, that the, the baby in the womb is kind of like a slave, right, to the mom. It's up to her whether that child will be born or aborted. Um, what can you say about this whole concept? Do you like that concept we have here at Priest for Life, civil rights for the unborn? What can you say about that? Well, yes, you know, the, the thing about it is, Janet, is um, it, it's really a, a life and death issue that's become politicized. I mean, if, if we're talking about rights for people, and this is a country based on rights for all people, then it should include the most vulnerable of our population, the most vulnerable people, the people that can't speak for themselves, the people that can't help themselves. And so, um, and that would include, of course, the unborn and those in the womb. And so we ha we live in a culture that tries to rationalize that away. For example, well, it's not really a person, it's a blob of tissue, really. So when you get pregnant and you, 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 you show your husband the, the test, oh, we have a brick, we have a slice of pizza, we have a, a, a piece of wood, and at some point it'll become a baby. No, nobody does that, come on. Everybody knows it's a life. But what they have to do in order to rationalize taking that innocent life is to say that that is not a person at all. That's what Hitler did. That's what they did during slavery. The Dred Scott versus John F. Sanford decision in 1857 said that black people were property and not human beings. Of course you have to say that if you're gonna enslave someone. Because if you see the person as a human being, made in God's image and likeness, then, you, then they have rights and you can't enslave them. But by saying they're not human beings, then you can impose your will on them. And that's exactly what happened in this country um, before 1973, and that's, what's, and that's what's happening now. And you're right, the unborn are the, the uh, should be the, the new civil rights uh, movement uh, proponents. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and of course, Deacon Harold, as you know, in the black community, uh, they are targeted by Planned Parenthood. Uh, I know in New York City, where I am originally from, more black babies are aborted in New York City than are born. And if you look at the demographics of where Planned Parenthoods are, they're like, circled around all the black neighborhoods, like so many of them. I mean, there's one place in downtown LA, uh, Deacon Harold, where I think there's about between Planned Parenthood and freestanding other abortion clinics. There used to be a dozen. I think they've whittled it down to about eight in a two mile radius. Now, if that's not targeting, what is? I mean, what can you say about that? It's so blatant and obvious. And yet, when you look at the politicians, right, you have the, the black caucus, right? Uh, the NAACP, all these black organizations, they're pro-abortion 
and they're helping Planned Parenthood, the very organization that is now training their guns on the black community. What can we say about that? Well, here's the thing. Margaret Sanger, without question or, or without doubt, was a eugenicist. If you read her writings, and I'm, I'm going to bring this out very clearly in the book. In fact, in my, in my last book on um, the, the legacy of Father Augustus Tolton, the first black priest in the United States, I do bring out some of those facts about Planned Parenthood. They particularly target the, the, the black race and people of color and also uh, those with Down syndrome and those kinds of things. They, they use words like deformities, human waste. We don't want the black people to know that we're trying to exterminate them. Those are actual terms that are used by Margaret Sanger in her writings. And in the book, I will show you explicitly uh, page numbers, references. All of this is in the Library of Congress. You can look it up for yourself. There's no question she was trying to exterminate black people. That's, and Planned Parenthood is continuing that today. The problem is we have a lot of black people who are still slaves. All these politicians are looking out for their own best interests and not looking out for the interests of black families. If they really cared, they would, you know, look at 70% of, of black children born out of wedlock. You know, what about rebuilding strong families, helping men to understand that this hit it and quit it mentality is not who we are um, that we talk about. And we, so we give ourselves African names, wear African clothes, but we don't have the African values. You know, remember, um, during the Obama administration, they tried to export contraception. They, they tried to export abortion. They tried to export all these things to the African countries. The African countries, you know, said, not here. You know, that's not who we are, you know? Uh, and so we, if we're going to uh, adopt these values, then we, we should be able to live those out and not politicize them. That's the problem. The, these Again, these are life and death issues that have tremendous import and impact on family life that have become politicized. And any person that supports that, especially from the from the black community, and I say black instead of African-American because I'm from the Caribbean. Um, and so technically I am not African-American and I wanna speak for all people of, uh, black people of color from different parts of the world that now live here in the United States. Um, if, you, if you follow um, plant parenthood, if you adopt that mentality and adopt that philosophy, then you are still a slave. Wow. That's great. Well, Deacon Harold too, I also know, um, in your heart is a concept of pilgrimages. And a lot of people have been on pilgrimages, as you know, and you get on the bus and you go see this holy site, get back on the bus, off to the next holy site, back on the bus. But you've got a new vision for what a pilgrimage should look like. Give us your idea about these pilgrimages that you're going to start doing. Yes, thank you, Janet. As soon as we're able to do them again, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> yeah. What 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 uh, what we're looking at was something called contemplative pilgrimages, and you're right. Uh, so often, and it's a beautiful experience when you go someplace, you see these amazing holy sites uh, where the you know, places where our Lord walked, where the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, appeared where the great saints lived their lives and did their work in the Lord's vineyard. And uh, oftentimes it's what we call the hamster wheel, right? You just do, 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 off the bus, take pictures, pray a little bit on the bus, back to the next site. What we want to do is we want to slow that experience down. And we want people to really um, deepen their intimacy with the Lord during this experience. So we're going to have, you know, maybe visits to one site a day and spend the rest of time in adoration, in scriptural rosaries, in uh, confession and Eucharistic adoration with short vignettes and short talks that draw people deeper into the mystery of the place that we're going to be seeing or visiting that day. Uh, we're going to be also doing corporal works of mercy. You know, we're going to be working in soup kitchens and, and doing things like that to really immerse ourselves in the lives of the culture of the time of the saint or our Lord or our blessed mother and really get a deeper um, feel uh, for for what it's like to really live our Catholic faith with with passion and conviction, and and be much more prayerful and intimate experience. And so uh, we we're, we're, we've put out all together, but because of COVID, we really can't do the first contemplative pilgrimage until 2023, um, because we're we're still trying to uh, reschedule the ones that were canceled for the past year and a half due to COVID. But I'm excited to roll that out. 
And of course, I'm excited too, because I know you and I are going to be in discussion about uh, a trip maybe in 2023 to the Holy Land. And maybe we'll do a semi-contemplative, okay? Because I don't know, Deacon Harold, if I could be total contemplative, but you know, everyone knows I'm all woo -woo action. So maybe we'll do a semi-contemplative because I really want to get back to the Holy Land. So I'm hoping and praying um, all this goes away. So just quickly, tell us how if people want to get your books or sign up to say, hey, tell me more about the pilgrimages. Where can they go to to be involved with you and get your books and get involved? I made it really easy for everyone. Just deaconharold.com. Uh, and if you scroll down that first page, you can access everything from my site from that first page. You'll see all my books. You'll see Power in My Hands, the movie I was in about the, the rosary. Um, you can see uh, the store page has all my uh, CDs, DVDs, which are also downloadable and also a uh, streaming service as well. So everything's at deaconharold.com. And that's where too, if they say, hey, Deacon Harold, put me on your pilgrimage list. So yep, when you the can time sign comes, up. Mm -hmm. We can sign up and know what's going on, right? Exactly right. Yep, exactly, exactly. right. Exactly. And of course, I'm going to have you back because I think we've got a lot more to talk about, you and I. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I'd love to, to come back. About. We've just barely, uh, what should I say, scratched the surface here of, uh, of what we can be talking about. And listen, I want to thank you too for all you do uh, on race relations, on things for the unborn, and also too about strengthening people in their spiritual lives. I love your concepts of we got to slow things down. Too many of us live in a hamster wheel. And I like that concept, whether it's on a pilgrimage or just in your daily lives, we have to stop the wheel, pick up those rosaries and be in adoration more. So thank you for joining me today, Deacon Harold. I'm very privileged to have you as my guest here on the program. Thank you, Janet, for having me. I appreciate it very much. Okay. God bless. Well, brothers and sisters, thank you too for joining me on Just Ask Janet. And remember what Deacon Harold said, deaconharold.com. Very easy. He's got a new book coming out, so he'll be announcing it there. The pilgrimage idea. I know he and I are going to work on a, a pilgrimage that we can do together. Uh, just so many exciting things. And I also want to remind you that Deacon Harold also does speaking engagements. So be in touch with him. And remember, brothers and sisters, there are some abortions only you can stop and some lives only you can save. Join me again next time on Just Ask Janet. God bless.